Chapter 13 of The Creature from Beyond Infinity by Henry Cutner. Read by Mark Nelson. The Sleepers Awake. Court busied himself with the golden haired girl. Jansaya's feline, sophisticated green eyes and the vague suggestion of cruelty about her lips were not apparent now as she lay in cataleptic sleep. Rather, she seemed some elfin creature out of Earth's myth haunted past a daughter of Neptune. The gossamer, violet-tinted robe scarcely veiled the alluring curves of her slim form. Her lashes lay golden on the rose-petal cheeks. She seemed so helpless, so childlike. Utterly trusting, she lay curled like a kitten on the couch. The poignant loveliness of the Atlantean girl was suddenly an aching stab in Court's heart. He felt no passion for her, no infatuation. She was too completely removed from mundane life for that. But Jansaya curiously seemed to typify and embody for court something he had never known. Out of the world's youth she was youth, a symbol of the dreams that most men know before they grow too old. Staring down at Jansaya, Court realized that he had never known youth and wondrous dreams. Unexpectedly, he thought of Marion Barton, whom he had left on earth. He put her out of his mind by working swiftly. Occasionally Thordred came to the door of the laboratory to watch, but as time wore on the giant appeared less often. Though he had learned much when the thought-transference helmet had given him the knowledge of Ardath's brain, Thordred had not acquired the Kyrian super-mentality. Guiding the ship back to Earth was a difficult task. Besides, he was busy making certain adjustments on the thought helmet. So he remained in the laboratory and did not see Jansaya awaken. Court had turned away to stare curiously at the other two sleepers, Li Yang and Scipio the Carthaginian. The giant warrior puzzled him. Since the man wore only a breech-clout, Court found it hard to guess his origin. The color of his skin was negroid, but the thin, firm, harsh lips and the hair certainly were not. Li Yang, though, was obviously an Oriental. What did that mean? Had his spaceship actually come from another world? The golden-haired girl might have been born on an alien planet, perhaps even Thordred and the sleeping naked giant. But the Oriental? Court frowned, and then glanced at Jansaya as she stirred. She had been breathing regularly for some time. Now her lashes fluttered and her green eyes opened. When she looked up at Court, a soft, wordless sound of inquiry murmured from the red lips. Athloye siavo. Court matched the girl's language, which he did not know was Atlantean, with Latin. Don't try to talk yet. You are safe." The brows wrinkled in puzzlement as the cruel gaze scrutinized him. "'Am I safe? Of course. But where is Ardath?' "'Dead. Thordred—' Court paused, startled at the look on Jansaya's face. He saw fear and incredulous amazement, and a soft smile of evil triumph that repelled him. "'Dead? She turned her head and looked across the room. Li Yang, yes, and Scipio. But Thordred, is he dead also? No, shall I get him? Court rose, but halted as a slim hand touched him. Wait, who are you? Before he could reply, Thordred's harsh voice broke in. Jansaya, you are awake. Good. The giant strode into the room, his amber eyes intent on the girl. Briefly they flickered toward Court. "'We are in the atmosphere now. There is not much time. Come with me.' Thordred made a quick, stealthy signal to Jansaya, which Court failed to understand. The Atlantean girl pursed her lips but said nothing. In the laboratory Thordred pointed to a chair. "'Sit down, Court. Put on this helmet.' He picked up a bulky headpiece crowned with helical wires and extended it. Court hesitated. "'What is it?' he asked cautiously. "'Nothing dangerous. It will teach you my language, and teach me yours. 
certain memory patterns, knowledge of our native tongue, will be transferred from my brain to yours, and vice versa. Come." Thordred placed a duplicate helmet on his own head and sat down. Some inexplicable impulse made Court resist. "'I'm not sure,' the giant grinned suddenly. "'I told you, I mean you no harm. If I had wanted to kill you, I could have done it long ago. I need your knowledge, and you need mine." Thordred chuckled at some secret thought. "'And it is best that we know each other's language.' "'All right.' Court nodded and slipped the helmet on his head. Simultaneously Thordred leaned forward and touched a keyboard. There was a whining crackle of released energy. Court felt the momentary agony of intolerable stricture about his skull, then it was gone. The scene before him was blotted out by a curtain of darkness. He lost consciousness. It seemed scarcely a second later when he awoke. Painfully opening his eyes, he saw that the laboratory was empty. His head ached fearfully. The helmet, however, was gone, as he discovered by investigating with his hands. "'Awake, eh?' The words were unmistakably in English. Thordred stood on the threshold. He went to a shelf, took a flask from it, and gave it to Court. "'Drink this. It's a stimulant. Not like your—' what was it, brandy, but equally potent. Court gulped the fluid, which was tasteless and incredibly cold. Immediately his headache was gone. He glanced up at the giant. "'You learned English, I see. That helmet's a handy gadget. But I didn't learn your language.' "'No,' Thordred admitted. "'The adjustment wasn't quite accurate. But it doesn't matter. There's plenty of time.' Meanwhile, as you say, I can talk English. Only that was necessary for us to be able to discuss scientific principles." Stephen saw the common sense of that. There were no ancient Latin terms for modern scientific theories and devices. "'Where are we now?' he asked. "'On earth,' Thordred glanced searchingly at him. "'Court, I'll be frank with you. I learned more than merely your language from your mind. The plague that worries you, for example. I acquired your memory of that." "'You did?' Court's dark face twisted in a scowl as he felt the premonition of danger. Just how much had Thordred learned from him? He shrugged, knowing that it did not matter. The bearded giant was a friend, the only strong ally on earth. Why look for trouble where none existed? "'I've decided what's best to be done. Thordred said. This plague, I know no more about it than you do. I don't know its origin or its nature, nor any way of defeating it." Court leaped to his feet, a sick emptiness in his stomach. "'Thordred, with your science and mine we should be able to find some way of conquering it. There's only one way. Earth is doomed. Anyone who remains will eventually be destroyed. But this is a spaceship court, and it isn't necessary for us to wait for destruction." With a lifted hand, Thordred forestalled interruption. "'Wait. There are other planets where life is possible, where the plague doesn't exist. We can carry from fifty to seventy passengers, men and women. That will be enough to start a new race and civilization on another world.' "'No!' Court scarcely knew he spoke. You mean go off and leave the world to doom? What good would it be to stay? We'd merely guarantee our own destruction. You're a strong, intelligent man, Court, the sort of person I want in the civilization I shall build. That's why I did not kill you." Court's eyes narrowed. There was a dead silence. Thordred's chill glance did not falter. I can kill you even now quite easily," he went on slowly. But the choice is yours. Join me, serve me with your fine brain and muscles, and you need not die. What's your answer?" Court was silent, trying to analyze his feelings. Of course, his anxiety to defeat the plague was purely scientific. How could he, a super-intellect, feel any sympathy for ordinary men and women. 
What did it matter if Earth died, as long as a new civilization would be built on a distant, safer world? A bell rang sharply through the ship. When Thordred flicked on a vision screen, Court stared at it. The spaceship had landed in what seemed to be a park. Suddenly he recognized it as Central Park in New York. About the ship a cordon of police was keeping back a surging crowd. A small group of uniformed men huddled close to the hull, using an acetylene torch to burn through the metal. Thordred grinned. Perhaps I could have landed in a less populated spot, but I'm impregnable. With the weapons at my command, one flash of a certain ray, and that crowd will be burned to cinders. You don't intend to, Court heard himself saying. But I do. The sooner Earth learns my power, the better." Thordred turned and went to a control board. Stephen Court stared at him. The emotions he had rigidly subdued all his we were flooding up into that cold brain of his. But it was not cold now. Burning in Court's mind was the face of Marion Barton, tender with humanity. He saw the face of old Sammy, brown and wrinkled. Sammy had sacrificed himself for an ideal in which Court did not believe. He had not believed in it till now. Court's heritage, the basic humanity in him, suddenly flooded through the artificial barriers of restraint. He had fought the plague to save men and women from horrible death, though he had not realized his true motive till now. Falsely, he had told himself that he was a scientific machine. He had almost hypnotized himself into believing it, but all along, Court realized now, his motives had been those of common humanity. A supermentality, perhaps, but first of all, he was a man. He would instinctively fight to protect those weaker than himself, even against insuperable odds. Court's breath caught in his throat as he saw Thordred push a lever in the control board. With silent desperation he hurled himself at the bearded giant. He was hurled back by a paralyzing shock. Thordred whirled, his mouth gaping. As Court tensed himself for another leap, the giant halted him with a lifted hand. "'You fool! You can't penetrate this force screen around my body! Stay where you are!' Court did not move, but his lean figure quivered with suppressed fury. You have your science, Thordred, but so have I." "'Your science!' Thordred bellowed. He thrust out a huge hand, gripped Court. "'Listen to me. I told you I learned more from you than your language. That was true. I drained your brain of all the knowledge it held. Your memory is mine now.' Court went sick as the import of the word struck home. His gaze went from Thordred's face, moved swiftly about the laboratory for some weapon. But the apparatus was utterly unfamiliar to him. Yet it had to be based on rigid scientific principles that would be the same in any universe. Court's mind worked with frantic speed, trying to find some coherent pattern. Levers, buttons, wiring, transparent tubes, each one had its definite part. On one panel several red lights were flashing on and off. Below each light Court recognized what must have been push-buttons. There were two possible answers. Either the switchboard had some connection with Thordred's death-ray, of which he had spoken, or else it was part of an alarm system. It was probably an alarm system, since Thordred was busy at another instrument panel. The police outside the ship were trying to burn through a port and the red light was flashing. The button beneath that light, Court decided, probably opened the door. His face was immobile as he shrugged, deliberately letting his shoulders droop despairingly. Thordred's mouth twisted into a triumphant grin. He half turned from his prisoner, and his hand touched the lever again. And then Court sprang. Not at Thordred. He leaped toward the panel where the red light glowed. His finger stabbed out and depressed the button. Chapter 14 The Plague Strikes Thordred's roar came too late. A burst of sound welled into the ship. 
Men were shouting, and footsteps tramped loudly on the metal floor of the airlock. Court sped to meet them. His hands lifted above his head, he was shouting warning. The skin of his back crawled with expectation of an attack. But Thordred did not pursue. Instead, there came a sizzling crackle from behind Court. Strong hands caught him, and he found himself in the midst of a group of police. He turned. Across the door of the laboratory a veil of wavering light flickered. Court seized the arm of an officer to prevent him from moving toward the hazy glow. "'Wait! That's dangerous!' "'What do you mean? Who are you?' "'Never mind that now. Shoot through that light, but don't go near it. You may be electrocuted.' The leader of the group, a gray-haired, bulky man, stared. "'I know you. You're Stephen Court. I've seen your pictures in the paper. What is all this about, anyhow?' Court swiftly noted the insignia of rank on the man's blue sleeve. "'There's no time now, Sergeant. There's a killer beyond that light barrier. He's got to be stopped.' "'But we can't shoot down a man on your word.' Court sucked in his breath. Then his hand went out in a blurring motion. Grabbing a heavy revolver from one of the officers, he whirled and pumped bullets at the barrier of fire. Flame crackled and snarled. The bullets could not penetrate the barrier. Half melted, they dropped to the floor. The revolver was wrested from his hand. The sergeant eyed him in amazement, holding the smoking gun. "'I tell you—' Court made a gesture of despair as he heard a low whine, rising in pitch and intensity, throbbing through the ship. He knew that Thordred was busy in the laboratory. He tried a new tack. "'This ship may be blown up at any minute. Get your men out. Keep the crowd back!' He hesitated, then pointed to the unconscious forms of the Chinese and the gargoyle-faced giant on their couches. "'Get them out, too!' Jansaya, the Atlantean girl, was nowhere in sight, and there was not time to search for her. The menace of explosion the sergeant could understand. He issued swift orders. His men swarmed out of the ship, carrying the cataleptic men. Court followed. He could not guess what Thordred would do now, but he suspected that the killer might loose his death rays on the mob. Orders ran from one officer to another. The crowd was pushed back, milling, asking questions, shuffling unwillingly. Standing at the sergeant's side, Court bit his lip in indecision. What now? Thordred was impregnable behind his force screen. Without equipment, Court could do nothing. With the right apparatus, he knew, he could find the vibration rate of the screen and neutralize it. But there was no equipment here. "'This got anything to do with the plague?' the sergeant said. "'We're evacuating New York, you know.' "'What? Evacuating New York?' "'Yeah, the plague's hit us. The city's a death trap, with eight million people here. Martial law's been declared, though, and everything's under control. The whole city's moving out before the plague spreads.' Court nodded, staring at the ship. Well, clear the park and get some planes to bomb our friend here. I don't know if explosives will harm him, but it's worth trying while there's still time. As for those two unconscious men you took out of the ship, get them to a hospital. We'll—' There was a sudden interruption. From the golden hull a ray of cold green brilliance probed. As it shot toward court he felt a wave of icy chill. All the strength was abruptly drained from his body. He felt himself falling. The ray flamed brighter, turned to yellow, then to white. It splashed in pale radiance over the sergeant. His strong face seemed to melt, the flesh blackening incendiary horror over the bone structure. The officer dropped without a sound. Through filming eyes, Court saw the golden spaceship rise from its resting place. It shot up and hovered. Fleeing abruptly into the western skies, it was gone. When the ray touched court, it had not been strong enough to kill, only to paralyze. But the sergeant was horribly dead. Court felt himself slipping down into the black pit of unconsciousness. His last memory was that of some small bird wheeling above him against the blue. 
Then darkness took him. Hearing returned to him first. The sound was confused and chaotic. Court lay motionless, striving to analyze it. As if from a vast distance, he seemed to hear a babble of voices faintly mumbling what sounded like gibberish. Piercing through this was a medley of shrill whistles and siren-like noises that were utterly inexplicable. Then Court opened his eyes, looked straight up at a bare white ceiling. Sunlight made square patterns on it. He could move, he discovered. Without difficulty he sat up, found that he was in one of a row of cots that ran down the length of a long room. He was in a hospital. Court's voice cracked when he cried out. He tried again, but roused only an echo. Wonderingly, he rubbed his chin and gasped in amazement. A beard? He must have been unconscious for two weeks at least. He rose, shivering in his regulation hospital nightgown. Though the windows were closed, the room was icy cold. Rocking weakly on his feet, Court looked around. The man in the next bed looked familiar. It was the obese Oriental he had last seen in the Golden Spaceship. The man lay silent, motionless, no breath lifting his huge paunch. In the cot beyond lay the scar-faced giant, the man who had resembled a gladiator. He too was apparently dead or cataleptic. Some of the other beds were occupied, Court saw. He made a quick investigation. Strangers, and dead, all of them. Some had plainly died of starvation and thirst. The blankets in most cases were tumbled and twisted, and some of the bodies on the floor where they had apparently flung themselves. One grizzled oldster was huddled in a heap near the door, his skinny hand still outstretched for aid that could never come. The hospital must have been deserted. But what could have caused medical men to forsake their patients? Physicians do not break the Hippocratic Oath so easily. That meant the plague. His throat tight, Court stumbled to a table where a carafe of water stood. It was stagnant with long standing and half evaporated, but he gulped down a repulsive swallow. A folded newspaper on the table caught his gaze. Hastily, he folded the paper to the first page. Flaring headlines greeted him. Plague strikes New York. Twenty carriers reported in Manhattan. Mayor orders city evacuated. Hastily linotyped columns gave the story. All over greater New York the plague had suddenly appeared. In Queens, Brooklyn, the Bronx, from Harlem to the Battery, the shining men, harbingers of weird death, had come into being. Thinking the invasion had arrived by way of Jersey and the surrounding area, the mayor had directed the evacuation to take place northward. But in the box labeled Latest News Bulletins, it became apparent that the infection was spreading with fatal speed. Among eight millions of people, the plague ran like wildfire. Well, judging by his beard and the date of the paper, that had been two weeks ago. What was the country like now? Court went to the window and stared out. The bleak, snow-covered expanse of Central Park was far below. Small, irregular dark blotches lay on the whiteness. Were they bodies? Court found a telephone and jiggled the receiver impatiently. Not even the dial tone answered him. New York must be entirely deserted, save by the dead. Again he went to the window. This time he saw a shining oval of light dwarfed by distance, gliding under the trees in the park. A carrier. Court knew he could not remain in New York. With a nod of decision he glanced at the two motionless figures on the cots beside his own. Hastily he began to gather equipment. He saw a use for the Oriental and the giant. He could not leave them here, frozen in cataleptic sleep, even if he did not think that their knowledge might prove valuable. He used heat, stimulants, and artificial respiration. The stimulants were easy to procure after a trip down the corridor into adjoining wards. It was harder to find adrenaline. Court had to break down a door before locating the drug, but finally he was ready. 
electricity, rather than gas, supplied the hospital. He knew there would be no current now. Court hesitated. Frowning, he stared out the window. He heard again the distant din that had awakened him, the faint hooting and the low mumble of far voices. Radios, of course! Innumerable radios had been left turned on when the evacuation had taken place, and they were still broadcasting. That meant there was still electricity. Relieved, Court found heating pads and pressed them into place about his two patients. Little artificial respiration was necessary. Under the shock of the adrenaline, first the giant and then the oriental stirred. They wakened almost together. Court gave a gasp of relief. Till then he had not realized just how much his fortnight of hypnotized slumber had weakened him. Despite slowed and retarded metabolism, he had not eaten nor drunk for weeks. Shivering, he sank down on a cot and watched his patient slowly and gradually awaken. There was so much to do. He must communicate with these two. But what language did they speak? Would they be able to understand Latin? After that, there would be so many things. Find out what had happened, leave New York safely. But the first thing, Court murmured, is to stow some food under my belt. No, he resolved, glancing down at his nightgown. The first thing I need is a pair of pants. Chapter 15 Under the Plague it was nearly an hour later when Court finally finished his story and learned from Li Yang and Scipio their own tale. Luckily, both understood Latin. When Court's knowledge of the language failed, he pieced it out in Greek, which Scipio knew. I am familiar with all the tongues spoken around the Middle Sea, the Mediterranean, the huge Carthaginian stated. This English of yours sounds like a hybrid language a mixture of Latin, Greek, Goth, and Zeus knows what else. However, I will learn it. We had a saying that those in Helvetia had best do as the Helvetians do, though all they generally did was freeze." Scipio chuckled deep in his barrel chest. "'We have a saying that jackasses bray at inopportune moments,' said Li Yang blandly. Therefore, hold your tongue, Scipio, while we make some plans." He sighed ponderously. So, Ardath is dead, eh? Eh, you, he was a wise man, and a good one. Also, I have lost my loot, so I grieve. I scarcely knew Ardath, Scipio confessed, though he saved my life, of course. But the nymph girl, Jansaya! I needed only a glimpse of her to lose my heart and soul." The gargoyle face twisted in pained memory. "'What can we best do, Court? Get out of New York. After that we can make our plans. I want to get back to my laboratory. But first—well, come along.' Court rose and led the others into the corridor. Li Yang shivered as the chill wind rustled under his scanty gown. The world has grown colder, he mourned. Not even on the northern steppes did I feel such a knife-like blast. Court was unavailingly pressing the elevator buttons. Guess they're not working, he said wryly. That means we'll have to walk all the way down. It'll keep us warm anyway. Watch out for any carriers. Scipio shook his head as the three hurried down the stairs. I do not understand this plague. Civilizations change, of course. New gods and new magics spring up. But what you tell me of this plague smacks of the Vrykralokas, the vampire." The others had no breath for talking. Scipio continued to muse aloud as they descended. When they reached the street, though, he was the only one who was not panting. Zeus, Apollo, Kronos, and Neptune!" he roared, staring up at the skyscrapers. Surely the gods must have reared these buildings! Did gods build the Nilotic pyramids? Li Yan asked with breathless irony. Men learn always, and always they build higher. But my poor toes will be frozen. 
He danced about grotesquely in the slush. You are a hardy race, Court, to walk about in these skimpy togas. Court was glancing about swiftly. Come in here, he said. He hurried toward a nearby shop. He had seen that the window was broken and a burglar alarm was clanging loudly from within. That explained the medley of noises he had heard from the hospital. Hundreds of burglar alarms, all over New York, were screaming. The mobs must have looted during their flight. This men's clothing shop had certainly been looted, judging by its appearance. Court could understand why property rights didn't mean much just now. He guided Li Yang and Scipio to the various departments and helped them outfit themselves with suitable clothing. "'Breeches and boots will be best, I think,' he suggested. "'We may have hard going. Pick out large-sized boots, or you'll blister your feet in an hour.' It was difficult to find clothing that fitted the gigantic Carthaginian, and even harder to equip Li Yang, but at last the task was finished. Completely clothed, even to fleece-lined gloves, the three returned to the street. Now they needed food and drink. Down the avenue a little way was an automat. Court led them into it, pausing at the entrance to examine a motionless, shrunken body that lay there. It was the corpse of a man, emaciated and pallid, frozen rigid. It was oddly shriveled, which Court recognized as the stigmata of plague victims. Though the man had certainly been dead since the evacuation of New York, there was no sign of decomposition. Draining of vital energy means absolute sterility, no germs or microbes, that's logical," Court muttered. At least there would be no danger of a pestilence. He smiled crookedly. Pestilence! There was nobody to be harmed by it anyway. A radio in the automat was humming noisily. Court hesitated, still inhibited by a lifetime of conditioning. But he went to the change desk and appropriated a handful of nickels. Supplying the others with trays, he carefully selected foods that appeared still edible. The coffee spigot ran a tar-colored, icy fluid, but it was somewhat better than the sour milk and stale water. Court went to the radio and adjusted it. Then he joined the others at one of the round little tables. News, he said, nodding at the box that was strange to them. I'll translate. Static is becoming increasingly troublesome as the plague grows, the radio blared. The electrical energy emitted by she-carriers interferes with broadcasting. European shortwave transmission is impossible. The transoceanic cables have failed. From Washington, D.C., comes the latest European news, brought by Clipper across the Atlantic. The plague seems to have concentrated its force so far in the Western Hemisphere, though its strength is increasing gradually in Europe. Ports are crowded as mobs try to storm their way onto ships outward bound. There is a feeling that on the high seas is safety. This is untrue. The Hosima Maru, a passenger ship, was today washed upon the coast at Point Reyes above San Francisco. Spectators reported that the only living beings aboard were several carriers. In grim undertones, Court translated. The eastern seaboard is still being evacuated, the voice went on. The United States is under martial law. As yet, the plague remains a mystery, though, all over the world, scientists are working night and day to check it. A scientific congress has been called at The Hague to convene tomorrow at noon. We are still receiving reports about the mysterious golden airship which first appeared in Central Park, New York, two weeks ago. Since then it has landed eight times, always in a sparsely populated area. Unconfirmed reports state that men and women have been forced to enter the ship. Two hours ago, according to San Francisco station KFRC, the ship landed in the Berkeley Hills. Court's voice rose excitedly as he translated. Scipio sat back with a grunt, and the Oriental pursed his red lips. So, Thordred's still on earth, Li Yang rubbed his fat hands together. Good, Court. There are marvels of science in that golden ship, 
all the wonders of Ardath's great civilization, if you can get your hands on them." Court frowned. As soon as Thordred finishes recruiting the people he needs to start a new life on a different planet, he'll vanish forever. The worst of it is, he's drained my mind, taken all my knowledge. Everything I know, I share with him now. But I've got to get back to my Wisconsin lab. I have apparatus there that will enable me to construct a weapon or two that might give me a chance against Thordred. But till I get to the lab, I can't even locate the golden ship." "'Then why do we wait here?' Scipio thrust back his chair and stood up, towering incongruously in the gleaming shininess of the automat. "'Let us hurry!' They went out. Behind them, the radio blared. "'Shall keep broadcasting as long as we are able. The city is entirely evacuated. We are barricaded in this station and shall remain here until our power fails, or until. This is W.O.R., Newark, New Jersey. All listeners are warned to leave their homes immediately, and— Fifth Avenue lay silent under a white mantle. Snow had fallen within the past twenty-four hours. The sky, however, was blue and cloudless. Singularly eerie was the silence that lay over New York, made more horrible by the mutter of radios and the distant jarring of alarms. These too would die when the power failed. There were bodies in the streets, most of them white mounded hummocks under the snow. Hundreds of automobiles had been wrecked. A huge bus lay on its side beside an overturned garbage truck. Twice they saw carriers shining pallid ovals of glowing radiance floating toward them. Each time Court led his companions into buildings, and through a roundabout course of passages and stairways that led them to safety. The subway might be safer, he mused, but there may be carriers down there, and the power's still on, of course. Court did not mention his fear of the carnage he might discover underground. Yet, curiously, the plague had left little horror in its wake. It was far too fantastically unreal. The bombs and shrapnel of war would have left blood and ruin. But this! There was only white silence, and bodies that were less like corpses than cold statues of marble. Here, Court halted by a parked automobile. No, there's no gas. He frowned, after a glance at the dashboard gauge. Come on. Scipio was peering into a window. Abruptly he kicked nigh and the glass fell in clattering shards. The Carthaginian reached through the gap and brought out a cavalry saber in its scabbard. It's light enough, he grunted, balancing the weapon in his hand. But it's sharp. We may need this. He fastened it to his belt while Li Yang was peering down the street. Court, the Oriental called. What is it? A carrier. I see it. Swiftly, Court guided his companions around the corner. They turned west from Fifth Avenue into Fifty Eighth Street. Half a block down, they paused at sight of two more carriers coming toward them. Court glanced around. On his right was a street blocked with a mass of automobile wreckage. The tower of Rockefeller Plaza rose into the sky. On his left was the entrance of an office building. But through the glass doors Court could see that the lobby was strewn with bodies, struck down as they tried to escape the onrushing plague. Court wondered with a strange twinge of pity how many of them had been ready for death. Probably none. He came to himself abruptly. There was no time for philosophizing. The carriers were closing in upon them from both sides. Scipio pointed to the side street. There, we can climb over. Wait! Court's sharp command halted the others on the curb. Here's a car! A large black sedan was parked a few feet away. Two bodies lay near it, a man's and a woman's. The girl, scarcely more than a child, lay in a pitiful little huddle on the running-board, her blonde hair whitened with snow. The man, a bulky, dark young fellow, lay with his face in the gutter, 
a cigar still drooping from one corner of his mouth. But the keys were in the ignition. Hastily, Court sprang into the car, turned the key, and pressed the starter. He really expected no response. To his surprise, the battery painfully turned the cold engine over. Court dared waste no more time. He glanced around. With a gasp of relief, he saw that the shining bodies of the carriers had halted. They were at least a hundred feet away, and there might still be time. He kept his foot down on the starter. The motor caught and abruptly died. Viciously, he manipulated the choke. "'Get ready to run,' he warned. But again the motor caught, and Court gunned it with great care. The echoes boomed out thunderously in the canyon of the street. Li Yang and Scipio sat tensely beside Court, more afraid of this noisy invention than the incomprehensible carriers. "'They are coming toward us,' Scipio reported in an undertone, feeling for his saber. "'I shall get out and hold them back, till—' "'No!' Court let out the clutch. "'Stay where you are!' The car jerked into motion. There was a sickening moment when the motor sputtered, coughed, and almost stopped. Court jammed down the gas, heard the exhaust pipe crack open with a deafening roar. Then they were plunging forward. But the carriers were ominously close. Into Court's mind came a weird, illogical thought. Pillars of fire and smoke. Was that it? It didn't matter, for two of them, directly ahead, were gliding toward the car. He spun the wheel, skidded on the slushy pavement. He shot between the two monsters, missing them by a hair's breadth. The sedan rocketed on, gathering speed. Court swallowed hard and wiped the perspiration from his forehead with the back of his hand. "'Narrow squeak. This is a one-way street,' he added with wry humor. "'And we're going the wrong way. But I doubt if we'll get a ticket.' They crossed Sixth Avenue, then Seventh and turned left on Broadway. Court headed for the Holland Tunnel. Before he reached the tube, he sighted a tangle of wreckage which told him that the route was closed. Hastily, he turned north along the Hudson, hoping he could get through at the George Washington Bridge. The ice-bordered river flowed past silently, unruffled now by any boats. In the distance, the Jersey Palisades were traceries of frost. No smoke at all rose on the skyline. "'Gods!' Scipio observed. "'This is a world of wonders, Court. What is that?' "'Grant's tomb,' said Court. "'Let's see what the radio says.' He switched it on, but got only static. He turned the switch off, for he did not know the battery's strength. He had almost a tank full of gas, he saw, and was grateful for that. Yet it would not take him to Wisconsin. He would take the straight western route toward Chicago, and then cut northwest, unless he could find an airplane. But in this disorganized area, Court doubted whether one would be available. They all must have been commandeered. The bridge was open. They shot across, disregarding the glaring speed limit signs. Court found the highway he wanted. He sped on, seeing no sign of me. He was reminded of the last time he had driven across the Wisconsin hills, with Marion at his side. It almost seemed as though nothing had happened since then, for the landscape was still incongruously peaceful. Only one thing betrayed the existence of the plague, the occasional wrecks seen beside the highway, and the absence of traffic. An airplane startlingly roared overhead against the blue. But Marion was not here. Court realized that he missed her. She was the perfect complement for his mind, the ideal assistant. There was something else, too, but Court subconsciously steered away from the thought, refusing to let himself realize why he missed Marion so profoundly. He could see her clearly, a slim, brown-eyed girl. Rot! Such thoughts wasted time, and there was no time to waste. Sitting beside Court now, crowded uncomfortably in the front seat, Scipio and the huge Li Yang writhed uneasily. They typified the whole new set of factors which Court must integrate into the problem facing him. 
his mind began to work at lightning speed, analyzing, probing, discarding. Swiftly he went over the problem as he drove the car instinctively through New Jersey. Scipio crawled over into the back seat and went to sleep. Li Yang stretched luxuriously, holding out his plump fingers to the car heater. "'Great magic,' he said with satisfaction. "'Not that I believe in magic, but the word is a handy one.'" The sedan thundered westward. End of chapter 15